everyone, my name is Ava and thank you for coming to our second Smooth Talk of the Year. The theme for tonight is Alternative Truth. My name is Anna, we'll be your MCs for the night. We are so glad to have four student speakers and can't wait to welcome them onto the stage. Our first speaker is Jenny who will talk about the alternative truth of teenagers' lives presented on social media compared to reality. Hi everyone, good evening, hello, thank you for coming. So this a story that I just wanted to share with everyone. When I was 11 years old, I got my first Instagram account. All my friends had been begging me to get one because they wanted me to follow them. I didn't realize from that point on, I'd start falling down the deep hole of social media. I remember learning how to use social media and being really eager to do what I had heard about it. You know, liking, commenting, posting, things like that. It was considered cool at the time. <laughs> My fifth grade mind thought, oh, you know, it's just a place to document and have fun. But as time went on, that was no longer the case. Rolling into seventh grade, I realized that I started to lack a little bit of self-confidence. Like any 13-year-old, I felt inclined to start wearing makeup and to be quote-unquote like the other girls. I wanted to feel pretty and I wanted to feel like everyone else. The claim everyone else is quite subjective, but I felt this way because of the things that I saw on social media. I saw other girls post pictures of themselves and other girls leaving comments such as, you're so pretty, or I wish I was just like you. I wish I was just like you. I wish I could go back and tell my 13 year old self to not feel this way. I wish I didn't compare myself to others because of what they would say. I wish social media didn't exist sometimes. Now, I'm not here tonight to, you know, bash social media and talk about all the comments that people leave, and because I actually think that when you compliment someone, it can be quite genuine and uplifting. However, it's, I'm also not here to talk about it's the worst thing on earth. But on the bright side, what all forms of social media have in common is that we get to stay connected online, even if we're not physically there. But aside from staying connected online, what I want everyone to ask themselves, why do you have social media? It could be that you want a digital portfolio about your life or it's how you receive the news about the world. But think about it, they all come down to staying connected online. Other than that, there's really no reason to have social media. When you're connected with others online, we subconsciously try to impress others on the things that we're doing so we can display it to those in the online community. Aside from ourselves, we are also interested in other people's lives because that's just the nature of human curiosity. If I, hypothetically, went on a trip to Hawaii this spring break, most teenagers' first reactions would be to take images to later post on social media. It would be because that I want others to see that I'm in Hawaii, and I would want others to like and comment on my posts. From an outsider's perspective that sees that I'm in Hawaii, they could potentially feel that they have to do something as well to post so everyone can see that they're also having fun over spring break, even though it can feel like an obligation. The alternate truth is that we have to show something on social media so others don't think that we have a boring life. The alternate truth is that we as humans psychologically compare ourselves to others so we don't feel different. The alternate truth is that we can have some online life that is very drastically different from our actual life. The alternate truth is that we're sucked into an online profile because we're constantly spiraling ourselves down into comparison. The alternate truth is that even when we want to learn about someone new, we turn to that online profile as a starting point, even though it could be very different from them as a real person, but we all do it anyways. The alternate truth is that there's really no way of fixing what's already done. When we post on social media, you're hoping that special someone will see that post and, you know, maybe even comment on it. Maybe that's why as teenagers, we're constantly checking our social media to see if they saw our story, liked, anything to get their attention. Once the screens go away, no one is watching but yourself. Now this brings back to why I wanted to share my experiences in fifth grade on the lack of self-confidence. Even though I was 11, the moment that I started using social media more often, I was unaware of the constant comparisons that I had to myself to other people. We all subconsciously do this, but the truth is, 
as we're using it that just to constantly impress others. Not because we're trying to stay connected or get the news, but sure, that could be the case. But the deeper reason of why is to ultimately have a perfect social media life that we always wanted. As a 16-year-old, now I turn back and I look and see how staying connected online has changed my life throughout the years. The realization of constantly trying to impress people is exhausting, unhealthy, and kind of concerning. Instead of trying to craft a perfect life online, why don't we all start living like no one is watching? It's easier said than done, but really start living life carelessly. Don't live to impress others online, live to have fun and to impress yourself. Here's an alternate perspective. Go on, live a little. Try something new that you never thought you would do. Tell the person you like your feelings, play a new sport, spend quality time with your family, take a hike. The list is endless. Whatever you may try and do, live a little. Do it all without any connections to tell the online world. Impress yourself and change the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was a really intriguing topic and an, and an amazing way to start off the show. Next up, we have Anna who will speak about alternate realities compared to relatively. Truth is not something as simple as we presume. It can be anything starting from a belief to a reflection of reality. Truths make reality. And so alternate truths can also be called alternate realities. It is important to alter how we think about reality and truth, which is why I'm here tonight. More specifically, I'm going to talk about alternate realities from relativity. The way reality actually works turns out to be much richer, far deeper, and more science fiction-like than I ever could have imagined. And one of the biggest revelations Jason Padgett had when he was thinking about motion was that an object's motion, when it moves, its total motion through space and time always equals exactly the speed of light. Space and time are so intimately connected, so interwoven, that they truly cannot be separated, which is why Einstein coined the phrase space-time. Plus, everything in the universe displays wave-like behavior, even time itself, even us, we're waves, and every sense that is evolved is dependent on waves. Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, the sense of magnetism, and animals. They're all dependent on waves. For instance, if we smell something, it is believed by many that we are not only detecting the shape of the molecule, but its vibrational frequency. When we feel something that's hot or cold, the reason why it feels hot is because molecules are vibrating faster, and if it feels colder, it's because they are going slower. So cold really doesn't exist. Cold is just less vibration. So it's just less heat. When we hear something, we're dependent on sound waves. And when we see something, we're dependent on light waves. And what's so amazing is that waves change based on the position and the velocity of the observer and the observed. Right now, all of us, we are waves as we travel through spacetime. For instance, everything including you in this building and the planet, we're all vibrating at a certain frequency and we're all moving through space. So as you vibrate and move, you're making a wave through space. Which is, so, we're all here in this building sitting on the planet Earth, which is vibrating as it moves around the sun, which is vibrating as it moves around the galaxy. So we are literally a wave within a wave, within a wave, within a wave. So it's pretty amazing stuff. And what is really amazing is that all waves are subject to the Doppler effect. So we, when we think of things like alternate realities, parallel universes, and Real relativity, it's really hard for many of us to actually believe that something like that is actually real. I mean, this piece of paper is blue, right? It's not blue and red and green. And you know, at the same time, if I were to sing a note right now, I would be singing that one note. I wouldn't be singing all notes in existence. But actually, the paper is every color. And if I did sing a note, you could say that, yes, I am singing every single note in existence. And here's the best way I can think of to describe it. There's something called the Doppler effect, and it describes how waves change based on motion. And so we've all heard a car drive by us. And you know how a car drives by us, it goes noom, and it changes pitch. The reason it changes pitch is because short wavelengths of sound, we hear that as a high pitch. 
and long wavelengths of sound, we hear that as a low pitch. So as the car is moving towards you or towards me, the sound wave is getting kind of squished together as those wave fronts get closer and I hear the pitch getting higher. Now the pitch gets lower as the car moves away from me because those wave fronts are stretching out and getting further apart. So I hear the pitch getting lower. But now if we add relativity to it and we say that the car is moving away from the person on the left, All right, imagine there's a person on the left. So, imagine, so there's going to be a person on the left and a person on the right. We don't have the diagram up here right now. But, so, on the left, the waves are stretching out and getting longer, so that person hears a low pitch. But at the exact same time, the person on the right, the waves are compressing and getting closer together. They hear the pitch getting higher, and the person in the car, they're traveling with the sound source or with the wave source. So they hear a medium pitch and no sound change at all. And then what you do right there is you stop and say, what sound is the car actually making for real? It's kind of a weird question, isn't it? Is it making a low pitch to the person on the left, a high pitch to the person on the right, or medium pitch to the person in the car? And it's actually making all three sounds relative to who's looking at it. And then you say, imagine there's an infinite number of people and they're all looking at that car and they're all moving at different velocities. Every single person hears a different sound and every single reality is real and valid. It's just that they're relative. So you know that old question of if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? It doesn't. It makes a wave, and only if something's there with sound receptors does it make a sound. The same idea applies to light. So we all look at that paper, and we said that the paper's blue, right? So you think we can see where this is heading? So we say the paper's blue, but blue is a short wavelength of light, and red is a long wavelength of light. And so if everybody in the audience had a twin, and your twins were up here with me, and we shot away from you, at close to the speed of light, the wavelength of light would stretch out and get longer, and all of you would see my, cha my paper change to red. And your twins in motion with me, they would see that my paper is blue. And then again we ask, what color is my paper? red or blue. And it's literally both. And then we take one step further and we say now imagine there's an infinite number of people all looking at my paper and every single, uh, every single person's moving at a different velocity. Every single person sees a different color and every reality is real, even though every reality is different. And so every single moment has a potential to literally be anything and every potential can be any reality. It is just the slices of space-time, the picture frames that you realize that become your reality. But all the other realities that you don't see, that you don't experience, they are all just as real. It's just that by you, they're unrealized. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for sharing this really interesting speech with us. Please use this time to chat with those in your cohort while enjoying a musical performance by Albie Gong.
the second half of tonight's show. I will now be introducing the winners to choose next for the Farewell University. Hi, everyone. And welcome to my Smooth Talk. So today I'm going to be talking about the Many Worlds theory, which discusses parallel universes by explaining it using the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. So before we jump into the thought experiment, I think it's important to give a bit of a disclaimer to open up your mind. So Schrodinger's cat is a theory that deals almost entirely with quantum mechanics. So I think that it's important to say that quantum mechanics and classical mechanics are completely different. Classical mechanics deals with macroscopic objects which operate by Newton's laws. You've witnessed the physics of macroscopic objects in your everyday life. This is why you know when you throw a ball into the air, it's going to go up until it reaches a certain point and then fall straight down because you've observed it before. However, microscopic objects that you can't observe don't function the same way. It was proved in the late 1800s and early 1900s that quantum mechanics don't operate by Newton's laws, meaning that microscopic objects like atoms function by a completely different set of rules. So with that being understood, what is Schrodinger's cat? Schrodinger's cat is arguably the world's most famous thought experiment. It was proposed by renowned Nobel Prize winning physicist Erwin Schrodinger in 1935. It relates to Schrodinger's wave equation, which he won his Nobel Prize for nine years earlier in 1926. His equation describes what quantum, atoms like what, what quantum objects like atoms and subatomic particles will do. His thought experiment is a way to think about the equation theoretically as opposed to purely mathematically, as I'd be very impressed if any of you understood what this meant. <laughs> so what happens in this experiment? So this cat looks decently scared, and unfortunately it's for a good reason. So in Schrodinger's experiment, there's a cat in a box with a radioactive atom. This atom has a chance of decaying and not decaying. If the atom decays, it will set off a Geiger counter, which is just a machine that detects radiation. And if the counter goes off, it triggers a glass vial to break that has poisonous gas inside, and this gas will kill the cat. Now here's where it gets interesting. So this radioactive atom is existing in superposition. Superposition is the quantum mechanical idea that something, usually a particle or atom, is existing in several different quantum states at the same time. So this radioactive atom is both decaying and not decaying at the same time. However, this means that the Geiger counter is both detecting and not detecting radiation, so the vial does and doesn't break, both killing and not killing the cat. However, you would naturally assume that within the box, the cat is either alive or dead. However, this is where Schrodinger states that according to quantum physics, before our observation, or in the moments before the lid is taken off the box, the cat is actually existing in a superposition between dead and alive. It's only when someone opens the box and witnesses the cat being either alive or dead that the cat becomes one or the other. Why is this? So first of all, you can't see a simultaneously dead and alive cat. And secondly, it's shown in quantum physics that particles can exist between states, like we talked about earlier, meaning that they can be slash are between states at any one point in time. It's not until you observe them that the matter must pick between either state. So therefore, because you're not forcing the cat to take on either state of dead or alive before the observation, it can exist in superposition between both. It's not until you take the lid off, until the observation, that the cat is fully alive or dead. So you might be wondering now how Schrodinger's cat ties into the theory of parallel universes. In Schrodinger's cat experiment, it is applied when the person opens the lid to the box. The many worlds theory states that anything that can happen, does happen. Because the cat can be both alive and dead, and the many worlds theory states that anything that can happen, does happen, when the person opens the lid to the box, the universe splits in two. That means that, in both, that both situations take place, and there's one parallel universe where the cat's alive, and there's another parallel universe where you open the box and you find a dead cat. Kind of a bummer. But while you might only experience one when you open the box, both are fully realized and exist. So, this many world theory does not just apply to Schrodinger's thought experiment. The implications of this theory are absolutely incredible to think about. This means that any time there are one or more possible options available for the universe, the universe splits and creates copies where each of these possibilities occur. Everything else would remain the same, and the only variation would be in that decision. All of these infinite universes are possible because the universe is infinite and ever-expanding, meaning that it could hypothetically contain all of these possible worlds. 
This theory is so incredibly interesting to me because it made me think about how small the odds of everything are and how lucky I am to even be alive. Because if you think about it, the odds, of, first of all, of your parents being born after generations and generations and then them meeting and the odds that they would fall in love and have you and you would live the life that you're living are so infinitesimally small that it really made me appreciate everything that I've experienced. And I wanted to talk about this and explain this theory to others because hopefully one of you will find it as cool as I do and maybe it'll give you a new appreciation for life too. Thank you. Thank you, Delaney, for introducing that truly amazing topic. Last but not least, we have Stephen reciting the poem, Paper People, by Harry Biker. My name is Stephen Son. Stephen Son is my name. And if your name is Stephen Son, and our name will be the same. <laughs> Paper People by Harry Baker is the poem I'm going to present. It is a poem about people and how their influences were spent on wastefully by a vicious group dynamic on social media specifically, where issues become paper thin, where it is hard to seek what is true. It is a poem about division. It is a poem about unity. Here it is. I like people. I would like some. Wait, oh, never mind. The slide is not here, but I would like some paper people. There would be purple paper people, maybe pop up purple paper people, proper pop up purple paper people. How do you prop up pop up purple paper people? I hear you cry. Well, I, I would probably prop up proper pop up purple paper people with a proper pop up purple people paper clip but I would prepare appropriate adhesives as alternatives, a cheeky pack of blue tack just in case the paper slipped. Cause I could build a Papa Metropolis. But I wouldn't want to deal with all the paper people politics, paper politician with their paper thin policies, broken promises without appropriate apologies. There'll be a little paper me and a little paper you and we could watch paper TV, we'd all be pay-per-view. We would see poppy paper wrappers wrap about their paper package, or watch paper people carriers get stuck in the paper traffic on the A4 paper. There would be paper Princess Kate, but we would all stare at paper people, and they will live in fear of color Jack the paper ripper. Because the paper propaganda propagates people's prejudices, papers printing pictures of photogenic terrorists. A little paper me, and a little paper you. And in this pop-up population, people's problems pop up too. There'll be pompous paper parliament that remain out of touch, who ignore people's protest about all the paper cuts. And the peaceful paper protest get blown to paper pieces by the comfy cannons men, by the empty police. And yes, there will still be paper money, so there will still be paper greed. And the paper piggy bankers pocketing more than they need, purchasing pot party to pepper their paper properties, others live in poverty and ain't acknowledged properly. A proper poor economy, where so many are proper poor. But while their needs are ignored, the money goes to big wars. Our army armies unfold plans for paper plans. We remain in prison in our own paper chance. But the greater shame is that it always seems to stay the same. What changes who's in power choosing how to lay the blame? They're naming names, forgetting these are names of people. Because in the end, it all comes down to people. And I like people. Because even when the situation is dire, it is only ever people who are able to inspire. And on paper, it's hard to see how we all cope. But in the bottom of Pandora's box, there's still hope. And I still hope. Because I believe in people. People like my grandparents who every single day since I was born have taken time out of their morning to pray for me. That's 7,892 days straight up someone checking I'm okay and that's amazing. 
People like my aunt who puts on play with prisoners, people who are capable of genuine forgiveness, people who are like the persecuted Palestinians, people who go out of their way to make your life better and expect nothing in return. You see, people have potential to be powerful. Just because the people in power tend to pretend to be victims, we don't need to scum to that system. And the paper population is no different. There's the little paper me and a little paper you. And even if the whole world fell apart, then we will still make it through. Because we our people. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was truly a wonderful poem. Now let's pass the show over to Ariel to conclude tonight's events. Hi, everyone. So, um, as you can see, it's the event ended a lot earlier than we thought it would, but that's okay. Um, thank you to everyone who supported our event, whether through physically being here or watching on the live stream. And the circumstances were definitely different this time around just because of tight end COVID restrictions, but we're very grateful that we were at least able to hold this event partially in person. We wanted to thank Mr. Geddes for his support, all our Smooth Talks organizers, Albie for playing the piano, our MCs Ava and Anna, Hansen who is managing the live stream, and of course all our speakers for sharing with us tonight. We loved how different all of their approaches were and we hope that you all had a wonderful time too. Thank you. Oh.